Hello and uh, welcome to our webinar on drawing insights from car accident reports using Python and Apache Spark. Uh, the demonstration today will be done on uh, IBM's Bluemix technology and hopefully it will give you some um, feeling for why IBM and, and myself are so excited about Spark and believe it's such a great technology for doing data analytics and really makes handling large data problems much easier than they've been historically. Um, to kick off, I kind of wanted to start out with, um, if you go to ibm.biz-datagurus, you can sign up to get a lot more information, education, um, as well as be notified of uh, future events like this, um, this webinar. Also, we have one scheduled um, on October 19th, which will go quite a bit deeper uh, than today's with some machine learning and some um, deeper text classifications. So, um, please feel free to you know, follow through on that link, as well as um, there's a handout that's a part of the, the webinar information that uh, has all the sign-up details and information on that, that next webinar. So um, there'll be, these will be happening regularly, and there'll be some um, pretty exciting topics coming up. So uh, hopefully we'll see you on the next one. Um, and again, just so you have that, it's that link to uh, ibm.bizdatagurus for, for all that information. And you can also follow us on uh, Twitter at data underscore gurus. Okay, so let me jump into today's presentation. Um, what, uh, what we're gonna walk through is just kind of a simple notebook that does some nice visualization and simple analytics on uh, accident information from uh, in New York. Um, this is the front page of Bluemix. So this is what you'll see if you go out and sign up for an account. Um, you can get a 30-day free account, sign in, and this is, this is exactly the screen that you'll see. And you'll have a, a number of different um, kind of buckets of different technologies that we can take advantage of on Bluemix, um, including you know, compute, data analytics, and storage. Um, if you click through on these, you'll see your existing um, technology or uh, instances that you've started if, if you have started any. So for example, in data and, an and analytics, um, I get my a couple of Spark environments and uh, Dash DB uh, database environment. And then if I want to create more, I can just click on a little plus. And at this point, I'm presented with a catalog of services and um, that I can that I can create and start up. And so um, the one, again, that we're going to be leveraging today is this Apache Spark. Um, and I'll walk through kind of what that looks like through in here in a second. Um, just be aware there are a ton of different services and things that are available, whether it's uh, APIs, you know, surrounding Watson, whether it's uh, open source technologies like, um, you know, uh, Elasticsearch or something like that that allows you to um, have some different storage mechanisms or search. Um, just a huge slew of different things. And then in within all of these is great documentation on the explanation of how to get started. Um, some of them have example applications that have already been built for you. Um, so there's just a whole slew of different uh, technologies and capabilities that exist here and that it can all kind of work in concert. So if I go back to my console and go to my data and analytics space. Um, I'm going to walk through, I have a, an environment set up called Demo 12. And when you pop into that Spark environment, what you get is a couple of different things. Um, I have links out to my job history server. Um, I have a repository of documents that I can read to learn how to do different things, whether it's just plain develop in Spark, or whether it's connected to specific data sources like DashDB or uh, an object store to, to store and, and retrieve data or, or um, persist data. Uh, there's also a learning center that we can get to, and then an explanation of how to run Spark applications. So leveraging Spark Submit, and um, if you want to develop you know, batch type operations that exist. And then um, what we're going to go through today is the notebook. So when I click on notebooks, it's going to give me a list of my existing notebooks that I've created here on the bottom. 
it's going to give me some examples. The one we're going to walk through today, the New York City traffic analysis. Um, the reason we picked this one is because when you go into that environment and you create your first Spark instance, you can load the exact same notebook that I'm going to walk through today. You can reference either the recording of the, the WebEx or uh, the documentation that exists for this to go through the same thing that I'm going to, I'm going to walk through today. Um, there's also some precipitation analysis. So there's a couple of really good examples here. If I click on create new notebook, this is how you can create your own New York City uh, traffic analysis. Um, you can see I'm provided with a couple of different things. I can create an empty notebook. I can import a notebook based on uh, IPython notebook if somebody shared one with me. Um, or, or I can pull from a URL. This could be, um, certainly could be like GitHub or um, any referenced uh, IPython notebook. And then there's samples. And there's a number of samples provided in here. Some of them are um, that precipitation analysis, uh, basics of getting started with a notebook, as well as drawing insights from car accident reports, which is the one that we're going to go through today. So the notebook I'm going to walk you through today, all I did was create created the uh, draw insights and then click Create Notebook. Um, and for just the sake of time, I'm going to pull up one that I've already created. And what you'll get is this notebook that's all filled out for you. And um, which will, there we go. Um, so it's all completely populated for you. It, it contains uh, documentation of each of the cells, all of the code, and by default, what it's going to present to you is code that's already been run. So, you know, for example, this executes and it has a specific output. You can go through and execute it on your own and uh, follow the instructions on how to uh, get up and running. Um, you know, it'll take, a, there's a couple of minor things that you need to do. One would be um, create an object store instance and then download this file um, with the CSV file for the, that we're using as our data source. And there, again, there's full instructions in here on how to go through and do everything there. So in our notebook interface, we're kind of provided with a few different things. Um, one is down the center here, um, we have different buckets of paragraphs. Those paragraphs can represent either code, um, like specific Python code, or they can represent a markdown so that you can make, so that you can document and kind of add um, some flavor to the to the entire story of what you may be trying to present with your notebook. Um, you can also see up here, I've got the ability to uh, save versions, um, download, and so I can keep a local copy of either the HTML output or um, the source itself, which would be an uh, IPython notebook. Um, and so there's a, a whole other slew of things up here. You can, we can restart the kernel. Um, we can clear and all of the output and have a clean run of the the notebook itself. And then on the right hand side, I have the ability to add data sources. Um, if I click on add source, you can see I can just upload a file. Um, also from Bluemix, you can see that, for example, I can I can select my dash db instance and insert that as a as a, um, a specific repository of data that I'm able to access. Um, also in this context menu over here on the right, I can see my notebook info. Um, and it has the description and information associated with that notebook. And I can also look at my environment. And this will give me specifics on uh, different pre-installed libraries that I'm taking advantage of, uh, what version of Spark that I'm using, and what version of Python I'm, I'm currently using, as well as a link out to the job history. So um, I can click the little arrow to make that go away to hopefully make it a little bit easier to see. So the notebook today we're going to walk through, um, basically pull in some CSV data, and then we're going to go through and create some charts. Um, we use, um, because there's enough data, we can actually create some pretty cool plot charts that make, um, that show um, and make a plot chart look like a map based on um, the different traffic incidents that have been reported within New York City. So we'll go through and, and capture the data. Um, we'll load some visualization packages. I'll show you how you can install your own Python libraries. And then we'll go through and cleanse and reshape the data and then um, present a couple more graphs on that data. So the first thing is um, getting the data. So 
to set this up, um, all I did was I downloaded the PSV file and then I uploaded it into my object store. Um, within the object store inside of Bluemix, you can see the specific credentials. So um, we, we create a simple function that helps interpret those credentials and turn it into a keystone. And then this is my credentials that are set up for this specific environment. Um, and I can just cut and paste that, uh, that dictionary definition um, right out of the credentials on the object store. Um, and then we create and actually call that function and pass it that dictionary with all of those, that information. So at this point, we can actually go through and load the data. Um, we're going to do a couple of things. We're going to add a PySpark module um, to Spark Context to make the CSV reading easier. And then you can see the like, fifth or sixth line there where it says collisions equals sc.txt file. Uh, in this instance, what we're doing is we're calling the Spark Context and going out to the object store and reading that New York Motor Vehicle Collisions.csv file. Um, and then we pull through and we create uh, the headers. So we pull out that first line and actually pull the header uh, lines out of it. And then we apply that to the, the RDD that was created. And then ultimately we can create a data frame that's set up with the different headers and the headers here, and then the body list, is the body of the rest of the data that skips the header. And at the end of all this, what we end up with is a data frame that's defined with these different values in it of, this, of the headers. One of the nice things with Spark is that we can, well, once we have a data frame created, we can simply print out a schema that will show us what the the data frame looks like. Um, if this was hierarchical data, like for example, if we'd use JSON as our source and had uh, multiple hierarchies associated with it, the schema does a nice job of transposing that as well. Um, so it actually goes down and shows us the hierarchy. Um, and you can see that it's taken a sample of the data and tried to make an estimate on what type of data exists in each of the columns. So knowing that, you know, zip code, for example, is integer um, and that there's, you know, string data in here on the street name. So this is uh, collision underscore DF is the, for, is the data frame that we're referencing. Um, we pass it take one, which means just pull back the first row. And you can see the actual data here. Uh, the data is represented as the uh, key value pair with the, um, the actual column name and then the value of that data itself. And then um, all of that's wrapped within a row. Uh, and then we can simply pull the count. And in this example, we've got 734,743 um, different rows of information that we're going to start playing with. Okay, so now we can load some visualization packages. Um, I'm going to show today um, just some simple visualization using Matplotlib, and and we're going to use Keyborn in there as well. Um, there also is another visualization tool called Brunel uh, that's available and, and well documented within the Spark environment. Um, and so it's, it's, they're, they're both really good, powerful um, visualizations and kind of have different pros and cons. Um, for the simplicity one, plot, Plotlib um, will allow us to do some nice scatter plots and really define some of the different parameters. And this is what I'm going to walk through today. So, one thing that doesn't exist in the environment by default is the Seaborn library. And so what you can see here is that if I do use a exclamation pip install dash dash user Seaborn, what that's going to do is it's going to use pip to go out and install the Python library Seaborn, and it's going to be specific to my user environment. So you can do this with a number of different things. For example, if I wanted to play with natural text, I can, um, I can pull in the natural text language toolkit and, and just simply do a pip install NLTP. So whatever really needs to be referenced, and this is one of the you know, very powerful things within the, the notebook environment that exists on Bluemix is the ability to add these different libraries and take advantage of the huge ecosystem of uh, open source components that exist out there. Then the next paragraph here, I simply tell Matplotlib that I want the graphs to be displayed in line. 
Um, there's also the option to save them as, as uh, image files. Um, but in this case, we just wanted to present right in the notebook. And then um, there's a number of different libraries that we're going to import here and just make it simple and easy to use from this point on. So we have the, the data loaded. And at this point, we're going to start doing some visualizations. Um, what we want to do is select all our columns of data that we want to explore. So you know, number of persons injured, contributing factors, um, the latitude and longitude we're going to use. So we're basically paring down the data frame to be specific data sets that we can use moving forward. And then we'll create our first visualization. Um, this is simply just going to take the latitude and longitude of the different accidents that exist and it's going to plot them. You can see that one of the things that we've done is that we've set limitations on the latitude and longitude to pull it within New York City. Um, we've also gone through and within the plot lab, uh, the plot itself have created a title um, as well as labels on the longitude, or excuse me, on the X label and the Y label to make it much clearer and easier to explain what, what you're actually seeing on the graph itself. Um, we've also set the color of the plots themselves so at this point to all be one color based on our dark sea green. And again, this is not using a map. This is simply a small dot for each of the accidents that have, that's occurred within our record set. Um, and it's kind of neat. You can see, like, for example, Central Park is, um, is completely empty, right, because there's no streets that exist within Central Park, so there's no accidents that have occurred there. Okay, so now one of the things that we can do is we can go through and pull um, the five boroughs and set those each to be a specific color. So we can say Manhattan is going to show up as blue and Queens is going to show up as black, for example. Um, we'll create a legend associated with that. We can also um, change our title back or now to say by borough. Um, again, we've had the same limitations on our latitude and longitude, and then we can simply plot that out. And you can see the different boroughs showing up in distinct colors um, based on what their latitude and longitude were and how they fell into that. Now we can go through and can figure out which borough has the total number of collisions maximized. Um, you can see that one of the things that we can do with the data frame is that we can actually group by that borough column and then we're simply pulling out the count and then we're ordering it or sorting it by the overall count. And then we're just throwing different colors, um, whether it's green, um, 7, 5 being gray, uh, Y, K, B, R values at the different um, boroughs just to keep distinct colors between them. And again, controlling the X and Y label to make it easier to read, throwing a title at it. And then ultimately you can see what we get. It's a nice visualization showing um, Brooklyn has the most accidents within this record set. Okay, so now we can add actually some more detail where we can go through and um, take the information we pulled out before with specific to body damage, uh, personal injury, and fatal accidents. And then we can plot those based on different colors. Um, so you can see we're pulling through um, one plot with the nothing, um, one plot with our injured, and one plot with our fatalities. Um, the fatalities showing up in red. And then if, as we plot those three different things, you can see in the graph here, or the, um, the plot map that we actually get those different values coming across. And it gives us a nice representation of the different types of accidents that exist and still um, powerful enough to outline and give us a clear um, visualization of the, of the New York City itself. Okay, so now what we can do is we're going to go through and create some simple cleansing of the data and some reshaping. Um, part of this will be some simple normalization. So if we take our collisions data frame and we're going to drop 
um, any of the NA values. So we just simply want clean values to come out. Um, in this example, you can see we dropped about 100,000 records that had a value of NA in them somewhere um, on street name and borough. And then um, we're, we're going to create, uh, we're going to pull out some um, spatial, temporal, and the rest of our data from the record set that we want. So this does a nice job of showing how you can pull out specific, specific records. Um, the other nice thing that this does is it shows how we can do something far more complicated where um, taking this example for spatial right here, we've created a function or a function called get spatial where we're passing at the entire row of data and it goes through and it actually pulls out um, a specific value from um, dictionary on from the street name itself. And you can see we've got three of the, these different functions created. Um, getting temporal where we're working with the date time and getting rest which is pulled through the rest of the columns. And then the nice thing with Spark is we can simply run a map and then pass each of those Python functions to that row set itself and then get the proper values back. And so what's happening here is we're creating a new data frame called collisions out and we're going through and creating a map um, and in this map command, what we're saying is lambda row, and then we're saying collisions out row is equal to calling each of these specific functions. For example, get temporal row, get spatial, and get rest. And ultimately what gets returned is a subset of the data that's been cleansed. And then we can also do things like um, go through and cleanse um, using a dictionary. We're going to take things like um, avenue and normalize it or um, first, second, third example. Um, we're just trying to cleanse it and make it as, as clean as possible. And then we can normalize and pull that data through as well. And ultimately the point here is, is that when we group by avenue, for example, um, or if we have multiple streets like, you know, First Avenue, First Ave, we want them to show up as the same, the same exact street itself. Um, so the first thing we're going to do within this, this cleanse data set is go through and look at the contributing factors. Um, obviously, unspecified is a, is a far outweigher, but driver distraction and attention is, is kind of the number one known reason of the accidents within the record set. Um, and Claire is a not a huge factor um, overall relative to the overall set. And then we can sort accidents by vehicle type. Um, again, what we're going to do is we're going to leverage um, going through and cleansing this so that things like ambulance and bicycle show up as other, um, and then things like large commercial vehicle or small commercial vehicle show up as truck. And then you can see the collision out categories is equal to a map. And then within that map, what we can do is replace that all of those values where uh, the vehicle type code is of a specific type. So if it's pedicab, it shows up as other. Um, we simply replace it with that. And then we'll pull out the uh, specific time, street, borough, injured, killed, auto, bus, truck, taxi, and other values out. And then we'll transform that um, by pulling out the specific types of uh, vehicle type code using this, this function. And then collisions transformed is equal to the transforms involved. So ultimately what we're doing is we're pulling out and cleansing uh, to figure out which type of auto or other it was actually involved in the accident. Okay. There's a whole bunch of different work that exists in here. And then ultimately what we can do is we'll get down to a nice clean um, 
final group by where we can group the borough, the street, and the number of accidents. And then we'll pull through the top 10 streets with the most accidents. And then we can go through and create um, a bunch of information associated with the different collision types, um, patch, et cetera. And then ultimately what you end up with is showing where each of the vehicle collisions in the city exist, and then specifically plotting the colors across these top 10 most uh, prone accident prone streets. And then this one goes back and references all that cleansing work that we did before, where we're pulling out the, the different types of autos um, and ultimately ignores other and then represents the bus, truck, taxi, and auto accidents. Um, interesting enough, you can see peaks and valleys as the different um, taxi or, or as the bus lines and um, truck lines are kind of coming through and more business hours, et cetera. That's ultimately the, the summary or the end of the, the presentation. So. Hopefully this gives you a good sense and gives you some source code that you can go back and digest and on your own time to really determine and figure out um, you know, some of the specific cleansing operations that we did, but give you a good sense of the power of what's capable with Spark. And then um, again, this notebook's available to you right from Bluemix. So with that, I can take any questions if there are any. Brayden, uh, there's a question that I just replied to, uh, but maybe you want to elaborate on it. And it's about, uh, the question was, are you using uh, Python on your desktop or are you using it in Bluemix? The person sorry, that asked the question felt it might be easier to do it. To the, it might be easier to debug if it was uh, doing it on the desktop. Oh, that's a good question. So. Uh, you know, ultimately, what we tend to find is um, there's, it's not easier to do it on the desktop because the environment can get built for you and be up so quickly. So um, the ability to just quickly log into Bluemix, create the Spark environment, and then have a notebook that I can develop on, like that process, I can get to the point of learning Spark so much quicker. It's, it's really um, a much faster path. If I have, and I have Python and Spark running on my notebook as well, or excuse me, on my workstation as well. Um, and if there are times when that development process is easier if I'm trying to develop a fairly complicated function or Python operation. Um, but when I start incorporating Spark, it tends to be a lot easier just to do it within the notebook. So hopefully that helps. And the next question is, are both ways supported? So yes, both ways are su supported. The, um, in order to develop on your own environment, you ultimately would end up um, leveraging the, um, the Spark submit to actually execute the code. And so um, let me get back to my Spark environment. On the front page of the of the Spark service itself, there's an explanation in here that talks through how to uh, leverage um, how to uh, there, there's a specific explanation in here on how to leverage Spark Submit right within the Spark service, and then that documentation would help you get started on your desktop. Oh, I'm sorry, right here, running Spark applications. And then if you click through here for details, there's a full explanation in here on how to leverage Spark Submit. So you could ultimately create applications on your own environment and then submit them to Spark. Okay, any other questions?
Anna, do you want me to answer the questions that are in the chat window? So I, I answered some of them. Uh, are they visible to everybody? I, a couple of these are really simple. I can just kind of run through them if you want. I don't know if everybody can see the answers. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so once can MongoDB act as a data source for Bluemix? Um, yeah, just about anything can act as a data source that Spark supports or that has a third-party library for it. Um, so it'd probably get into some trickiness with some padding, um, but certainly that, that capability exists. Um, in, in addition to MongoDB, like I said, there's DashDB support, there's Elastic, um, anything that we have available to compose. Um, would certainly be a possibility as well. So there's there's a lot of different connections or storage mechanisms that it can take. Um, the next question was, is there a doc that gives all the Spark library for Python API calls? A program in Python, not familiar with the Spark library. Um, so the so my favorite documentation source for Spark tends to be just spark.apache.org. There are a lot of examples and documentation that exists within Bluemix that are specific on like how to accomplish a specific thing. But if you're really just looking for a list of all the different API calls and a tutorial there, um, I highly recommend just going through the documentation on the Apache site to, to get started. Um, and you can also go through and read. There's a, if you click through correctly, you can get to the documentation and see literally a list of every uh, function and method that exists. Uh, the question around desktop, is there, um, I already answered that. Um, so there's a question here specifically around Spark ML and using uh, SciKit um, with Pandas data frame, and whether or not we see a drop in performance. Um, what I would say is typically the, the reason that people are using Spark and, and Spark ML, it's for scale. Um, and so typically what we're seeing is that a single environment or a single instance of almost any other open source, um, you know, like for example, trying to leverage pandas across a large cluster with uh, many hundreds of gigabytes, if not terabytes, um, really doesn't scale. And that's why we tend to go to Spark ML. It's not necessarily for instance for um, immediate performance, it's, it's for overall scale. Uh, somebody asked if we're going to post the slides. Um, so there's the handout that is attached to the webinar, has all the information associated with the two slides that I had. Um, in addition to that, this notebook is available through Bluemix. So to get the notebook, Go to bluemix.net, sign in, create a Spark instance, create a new notebook, and then select a sample notebook. That sample book notebook is that I went through today with the New York uh, accent information. Uh, somebody asked if we can use a Jupyter notebook for this also. This is based on a Jupyter notebook. Um, so if you have an IPython notebook exported from Jupyter, it should work fine. And then there's a question around Bluemix working on premise. Um, certainly, there, I think that possibility exists. My recommendation would be to follow up your uh, IBM salespeople. Um, and if you need help contacting them, um, just let us know in the comments. Yeah, and I think that's all of the questions I can see in the in the webinar control panel.
So yeah, um, so the, this meeting has been recorded and every one of you will receive an email with the link to the recording. And um, if you look in the chat, I just posted an email address. So if you have additional questions, if you want uh, a sales or a technical person to, to help you out with any of this, uh, please uh, just, just send us an email. Okay, great, thank you.